Hello, my name is Andrew Just, and in this module we will discuss the top-down approach to the probability weather type or PAUT methodology. A little review, again the idea here is that you forecast the environment and the probabilities of the precipitation types will drop out via GFE procedure. It's a much simpler approach when dealing with complex precipitation weather and much easier to update. It consists of three grids that you can create and edit as needed. And data from those grids you can get from the RAP, NAM, and GFS in GFE, which can be blended as well. So if you want to wait towards another model, you can. You can go strictly to one model. Or there's also the option of none of the models are doing things correctly. You can always create the grids uh, manually or start from a model and then adjust from there. You can also include road temperatures for those instances when, say, you're been underneath a pretty long cold spell, you quickly switch over to a general rain situation, but those roads are still cold and you're getting ice in on them, something that's kind of typical over in the northern U.S. And this entire top-down approach you can quickly access via the forecast builder. The first top-down grid we'll discuss is the max wet bulb aloft. It's defined as the warmest wet bulb temperature from 2,000 feet above the ground to 400 millibars. Observed values for this grid can be found in RAYUB and AMDAR data. Data again for this grid can come from the GFS, NAM, and RAP in GFE. And this max wet bulb aloft replaced the max T aloft in August 2016. And for most areas east of the plains, per our the La Crosse research, the max wet bulb aloft and the max temperature aloft are pretty much the same. However, when you get from the high plains westward, when it came, came to determine in precipitation type, the max wet bulb aloft performed much better than the max temperature aloft. And on the right, you will see how these values of max wet bulb aloft correspond to probabilities. So if you have a max wet bulb aloft, say, 0 to 1 Celsius, you're looking at my, mainly snow. As you go to 2 to 3 Celsius on max wet bulb aloft, you're looking at sleet, and then at 4 Celsius, you're looking at liquid. So, for an example, from December 1st, 2007, here at La Crosse, where we had a lot of mixed precipitation, you'll see in the mostly purples, whites, that's all your snow range, and then as you get into the blues and grains, those, that's that zero to two area, you're starting to switch over to sleet, get to the yellow, you're all sleet, and then the reds, that four to 10 Celsius, that's solidly all liquid with the surface temperature determining whether or not you are freezing or not. Okay, max wet bulb aloft was unavailable for this event, but the max teal off was nearly identical. The next stop down grid we'll discuss is the probability of ice present. And this is defined as the probability that ice exists in the clouds. As the values for this grid decrease to zero, you will see the probabilities of snow and sleet decrease and the liquid ones increase, like rain and freezing rain. Caution though that loss of ice can also mean precipitation is ending, so be very careful in putting this prob ice present grid in, G in your forecast. Only use it in those situations where you still have lift occurring within your moist layer. That's probably a shallow one. Observe values for this grid can come from IR imagery, RAYUB data, as well as AMDAR. Again, GFS, NAM, and RAP data are available. And how this is computed, the first check is to look for a deep dry layer Kind of like that cedar feeder process. This should be somewhat familiar to you from the top-down science training. Next will be apply aircraft research to create a probability based on the RH with respect to ice for temperatures that are minus 8C and colder. And so for an example on the right, you'll notice that rain, that area that's colder than minus 8 Celsius in the soundings pretty well dry. I mean, there might be a little bit in that minus, right around minus 8 that could be saturated or close to saturated with respect to ice. 
But for the rest of it, it's dry. So this example is pretty much a 0% in terms of the prob ice present. And if we look at the uh, curve here, when you get temperatures at minus 8 Celsius, you're looking at a 30% probability ice present, assuming it's saturated. And you go all the way up to minus 15, and now you're at 100%. And again, this comes from that aircraft research. For further doc details, reference the probability weather type documentation. Here's an example of prob ice present from that case, just 2007, December 1st. And one thing you will notice is this quick drop off to zero values as you head into the evening hours. This drop off was the result of a dry slot punching in. So along with the fact that we had the warm nose coming in noted on the max weapon off, we were also scouring out any kind of ice. So basically all precipitation was heading over to either a rain or freezing rain situation. The third grid to discuss on the top-down approach is prob refreeze sleep. And this is defined as the probability that liquid from a loft can refreeze. An example of a sound in for refreezing to sleep is shown there on the right. You must have a max wet bubble loft grid point with points that are greater than 3 Celsius to ensure liquid. In the example on the right we would have about a max wet bubble loft of 4 or 5 centigrade. Generally this is going to be a rare grid to edit. You may only get one or two cases a year at most. Um, most of the refreeze uh, sleet cases again are just just they're just rare. Observe values for for these can come from surface data combined with your RAOB and AMDAR data as well as dual pole. You may see a double ring in your CC. GFS, NAM, and RAP data are available and to compute this the first thing the computation does is look for a cold dome that is at least 2,500 feet thick and colder than minus 2 Celsius. The probabilities increase to about 10% at minus 4, 50% at minus 6, and 100% at minus 8C. And you can see that here on the graph that was pulled up. That as, yep, as you go colder, you get to that minus 7, minus 8C, that probability refreeze greatly increases towards 100%. And again, you can see the probably weather type documentation for more details. In the example from that December 1st, 2007 case, you can see that area of just general colors, you'd say, and that's the probability of refreeze occurring. And in this case for Lacrosse, we ended up having both sleet due to melting come through and then sleep due to refreezing before the dry slot and full warm nose kind of just came over through the area and changed things over to rain. The last grid, again this is only needed when you got road temperatures playing a role, is a grid called road temp. The typical situations for this grid include a rain falling after a long period of cold where the roads are now well below freezing, your temperatures are warming up, uh, maybe a 35, 36, you're raining, but those roads are still can't warm up yet. Or maybe you're dealing with freezing rain in late spring, um, that you're getting icing on, say, trees, power lines, but your roads are all warmed up now, and so they're not seeing any ice. So how this works is that if the road temperature grid shows values less than or equal to 32 Fahrenheit and rain is in the forecast, that rain probability will get copied to freezing rain. And similarly, if road temperature is greater than 32 and freezing rain is forecast, those freezing rain probabilities are also copied to rain. So it's kind of like a, you know, applying a 50-50 kind of idea to both rain and freezing rain for situations when you have a road temp grid in place. For observed values for road temperature, check out IRIS, and then forecast values can be found at the website listed here, which is also listed in Forecast Builder. Some additional top-down notes. First is that your hourly temperatures and dew points will separate rain from freezing rain, and the dew points in particular are because of the Fram ice model, 
where they found instances where your temperatures may be above freezing, but because your dew points are below freezing, that wet bulbing effect could cause icing on surfaces. Secondly, if the max wet bulb aloft is less than a half a degree Celsius, it's assumed to be a rain-snow situation, so you won't see any sleet freezing rain grids pop pop up if those max wet bulb aloft grids are set at those that value. However, if you have prob ice present grids that are you know, with values that are less than say 100%, you're going to see freezing rain pop up because you have, you're suggesting that there's loosening of ice in the cloud but still left present to generate precipitation. The third note is that deep slightly above freezing isothermal layer this is a kind of check to improve the performance a little bit of the max wet bulb aloft. So if you have the max wet bulb aloft greater than 1 Celsius and the temperature of 32 or greater than 32 Fahrenheit, the precipitation type will go to rain. <laughs> but you can still get freezing rain in this scenario if the temperature is between 32 and 35 and that surface wet bulb is 32 or below. Kind of cor correlating back to that first note relating to the fact that the dew point is important here. And again, that's from that Fram ice model research. And a sound in to show you that slightly above freezing isothermal layer is shown here, where you look all the way up to about one and a half kilometers and you're only a smidge above zero, but there's enough area there to result in rain. So a little precipitation type example I'll put. Again, this came right out of forecast builder, driving out the precipitation types. No human ed editing was done to produce these, and they would be pretty hard to produce <laughs> by a human. And again, this is incorporating all those top, all those three top down grids, no road temp for this specific situation. But this makes all your precipitation types agree with what the environment is that you forecast. So if you needed to go in and get more freezing rain, you could do that by increasing, say, your max wet bulb aloft, or if this was a case of a dry slot, say, inc decrease those values of prob ice present. So in summary, the top-down approach provides many benefits. You know, it's a quick, meteorologically sound way of developing precipitation type forecasts, and you can blend models. You're not restricted to one model. And your ability to handle scenarios more quickly when no models are handling the weather con correctly, you can look at your IR imagery and adjust your prob ice present. You can take a look at RAVs and AMDAR data and pretty much adjust all three top down grids as needed. You can also handle situations where you've got icing occurring only on roads. So more on this 2007 December 1st case we've mentioned about for the examples can be found at this website address. And if you have any questions or feedback, feel free to email me. Again, my email address is andy.just at noah.gov. Thank you.